So, okay, I'll start again. So we've talked a lot about, you know, tree biology and uh, the planning and the head work of uh, tree pruning. We're gonna, and how to make good pruning cuts. We're gonna start to get into more of the, um, the practical application of what we've been talking about. And in particular for tree stewards, we're gonna be talking about training young trees. <clears throat> and because I, as I understand it, that's what this program is about, is teaching you guys how to do this. Um, this is an example. This is from, I think it's called Park Fairfax, sort of over in the Farrellington area. Uh, this is not how you train young trees, unless, of course, you're a sadist. Um, if you look at it, some of these cuts probably are um, cut into the branch collars and then you've got all these stubs and I don't know what's going on with all these heading cuts or what this person was trying to achieve. Um, I was out there with uh, a different citizen who said this person insisted they knew how to prune trees and there was a whole line of trees that they butchered like this. So this is not how you train young trees. First thing to keep in mind, come on, is <clears throat> when you go out on the internet, you'll found, find all kinds of weird stuff. And some of it involves pruning off a third of the canopy and spraying with a desiccant, desiccant which is really bad uh, because the tree, when it's newly planted, needs energy. This is why right this is why the new ISA and ANSI standards say that at the time of planting you should only prune dead or broken branches. If you've got competing leaders, if you've got rubbing branch uh, rubbing branches, that's something you can come back and deal with later and this gets to that idea of balancing the energy needs of the trees against those pruning needs. Yeah, we do want to take care of that competing leader or those rubbing branches, but we don't have to do it now. The most important thing when we transplant is energy production. Reducing the crown does not increase energy production. It reduces it. The tree needs the energy to deal with the transplant shot, to rebuild its root system. So what you do, and this is what I said, pruning is not always the answer to the problem, just because you have pruning shears in your hand. What you wanna do is put away the pruning shears and get out the watering bucket or the hose because those newly planted trees need water and you cannot prune your way out of that. Again, when we are observing, we want to know what is the species. Is it a species that actually is supposed to have a strong central leader? So not all species do. For example, red buds do just fine. I mean, they can do well with a strong central leader, but they do fine with uh, co-dominant leaders. <clears throat> you also want to be thinking about where the lowest permanent branch is. And I will show you some pictures in a minute. We'll talk about it. But when that tree is first planted, probably all of the branches that are on the tree at that time are eventually going to get pruned off, depending on where you're planting. So we're going to want to figure out where that lowest permanent branch is. We also want to look and see if there are any permanent branches on the tree. Are there any we could potentially use for scaffold branches? Although that's usually going to come later in the process. Once the trunk, once the leader gets above that lowest permanent branch. We also want to know if, again, just like any other tree, has it suffered from recent stress, like pruning, like planting. Planting is a stress. 
And so you want to look at that tree and see if you can visualize based on what you know about the structure uh, of the species and what you are seeing on the ground, where are there going to be future problems? Um, sometimes they're really obvious, like I've got co-dominant leaders or I have two branches that are going to be rubbing against each other. Sometimes it takes a little more visualization to see that. When you are pruning your young tree, having made the, those observations, you want to reduce or remove competing leaders. And again, this is going to be a year or two years after the tree has been transplanted and after it has become established in the site. You want to look at those temporary branches and control their growth. Remember the one third aspect. Um, watch out. If you have temporary branches, you want to make sure they stay less than one third the diameter of the trunk. And if it does have permanent branches, you might start thinking about the scaffold branches, although that usually doesn't come until the tree is uh, maybe five to 10 years old and actually has uh, permanent branches on it. So in those first five to seven years, most of the branches uh, at the time of planting are gonna be temporary. So we're going to be pruning those off. We want to plan for and start working towards that single central leader. Um, any large vigorous branches we wanna reduce, especially if they're more than, greater than or equal to half the trunk diameter. Reduce and or remove all branches and stems that are competing with the uh, central leader. So that's part of the planning for the central leader. So you may have uh, a branch that is competing with the central leader and your initial instinct may be to remove it immediately, but maybe you can fix that by with a reduction cut. In fact, I know you can, and I will show you how that happens. If you've got those, uh, if you've got some very vigorous branches, you want to do reduction cuts on them because there may be in it or they may exceed that one third aspect ratio. And then, of course, if you've got any broken, cracked, or very damaged uh, branches, you can remove the, you want to re remove those. Maybe even reduced. If it's cracked, you may be able to do a reduction cut below the crack. And keep in mind that dose, because especially with young trees, you don't want to take so much to that canopy that you're going to reduce its ability to produce energy to recover from the pruning and to grow. So let's look at some of these things. The central leader. So this is my crab apple. You will become very familiar with this tree over the next hour. <clears throat> The yellow line that I've drawn in there is the central leader. The red line is a competing leader. So as I look at this, I observe that, that I've got a competing leader. My objective is to prevent that branch from competing. But I also keep in mind that I want scaffold branches. And it is possible, given the way that branch is growing, that that could be a scaffold branch. So I might want not want to remove it. I might only want to reduce it, but I would know that's something that I need to deal with. <clears throat> In 2008, when I first started working on this tree, and this was uh, three years after I had planted, um, four years after I had planted it, I assumed that the lowest permanent branch was going to be well up there and maybe there were it was on the tree then, but it wasn't on the tree when I planted it. And that's because I was looking at the fact that I planted it in what's sometimes called the tree lawn or the hell strip between the curb and the sidewalk. And I knew that I was going to have to have clearance 
eventually for the street and for the sidewalk. At that time, the tree was not, a, there was not a clearance problem, but I anticipated there would be. So I figured that all of the branches below that branch were going to be temporary branches and that I needed to keep an eye on them and prevent them from becoming uh, too big relative to the trunk of the tree. But remember, I told you this is a cycle. So I made a plan in 2008, but over time, what I discovered was I was wrong. My lowest permanent branch was actually way down on the bottom of the tree because this has something somewhat of a fastigate growth habit. And most of the branches grow out and then start turning up and they are not a clearance issue for the sidewalk or the dry or the, the road. So I haven't had to, to prune as many branches off of this as I thought I was. Nevertheless, with those temporary branches that, you know, all of this stuff down here that I thought was gonna have to come off, I wanted to control the size so that when I finally made that removal cut, I was making a smaller wound. I also wanted to balance the photosynthesis against the structure. So I, again, I, you know, I wanted to keep these branches because they were making sugar to help that tree establish itself and grow and thrive in this space. But at the same time, I didn't want them to get so big that it would become a problem when I removed them. With scaffold branches, these are the branches that essentially hold up the canopy of the tree. And you start with your lowest permanent branch. And this is, as I said, it's gonna give you a uh, structure for the tree. Typically they should be <coughs> <coughs> evenly spaced both uh, vertically and radially around the tree. And that spacing should be anywhere from 18 to 36 inches. and it's going to depend on the, the stature of the tree. So a big uh, mature canopy tree that's going to top out at 90 feet, you're probably looking at more like 36 inches for your spacing of your scaffold branches. But for that small little crab apple, 18 might actually be too much. We might want it to be less than that. And here are some examples from my uh, willow oak of bad. Um, scaffold branches. So these two were way, these three actually were way too close together. And you can tell by the progress of the, um, the wound closure, which one, this one came off first. So obviously it stopped getting bigger, but these three were too close. And then there's another one. Actually, there was a clearance problem with one of these. Uh, in this case, these are not necessarily scaffold branches. This is the scaffold branch, which I just noticed I may have to cable, um, but it had these two lateral branches, which were growing parallel to each other and were no more than about 10 inches apart. So I did have my arborist prune one of those off just because they were redundant. When we think about future problems with young trees, hopefully we have, we were thinking about that when we selected the tree. So a lot of our future problems are solved, not by pruning, but by planting the right tree in the right place. Nevertheless, the future problems we would, would encounter with these young trees are gonna be clearance, possibly over long branches. And by that, I mean, a branch that sticks way out away from the rest uh, from the rest of the canopy. Uh, I've seen trees like that where they'll have one big branch that just keeps going and really throws off the uh, balance of the tree. So it's shifting that center of gravity away from being over the directly over the root plate, which helps it. Excuse me, uh, helps it's the tree stand upright. <clears throat> there may be future rubbing issues where two branches are beginning to grow across each other. 
And for all of these future problems in these young trees, you want to apply that principle of temporary branches, which is you want to look at it and say, what can I do to make the situation better going towards eventually removing the branch? So that's still a bit theoretical. So I am going to give you a case study of training a young tree. And this is my crab apple. So recall earlier, I said, I pointed out that I had a competing leader and that's what it looked like coming off the branch. You can see it's going here and growing straight up a little bit smaller than the, um, the, the branch I selected for, to be the leader. So your aspect ratio here is well over one half. And then down here, I had another branch, which is growing off towards the sidewalk. And again, a very, very large aspect ratio where the, um, the branch is almost the same diameter as the trunk. So if I were, were to make a cut at this time, this is October 2008, I would have left a very large wound here that may well have become infected led to decay and it's very close to the base of the tree which probably would have cost me the tree so how did i deal with this well let's look at the competing leader first and you've seen these pictures <coughs> rather than remove it i went up and i found a good lateral and i did a reduction cut here so this is me lining up the cut uh visualizing the perpendicular and I turned my, I rotate my pruning shears and I made the cut. And this is what the cut looked like. So how did that play out on the tree? Well, this is what the cut looked like in 2006. Three years later, this is what it looked like. And I don't have any pictures from later than March of 2011, because by the next growing season, I couldn't even find the cut. And what happened to the branch? Well, as it turns out, it did become a scaffold branch. So this is what it looked like from left to right. You can see what it looked like in 2008. <clears throat> Three years later and 12 years later, notice the difference in the diameter of the trunk of the tree relative to the branch. Even by here, significant difference, and I might have been able to to cut it off, but as it turns out, I never had to. It was doing a good job of def helping define the canopy of the tree. So it is still attached to the tree. Notice, all I did was make this one cut when it was a young tree. That's it. I didn't do anything more to that branch. And now it is a well-respected part of the structure of the tree. That large, uh, vigorous branch down at the base of the tree, again, I made the decision to, to save as much photosynthetic area as I could. I made a reduction. In 2008, I adhered to that one-third rule, which is why I chose this as my lateral. Today, I might have chosen this branch as my lateral. Uh, it's less than a third the diameter of the, of the tree, but it's growing straight up rather than um, down or rather than out into the street. So what happened as a result of doing that? Well, notice two th 2008, very large relative to the diameter or relative to the trunk of the tree. In 2011, much smaller. And now we're down below that one third aspect ratio. And I think just before, just after I took this picture, I actually pruned it off. And by 2017, this is what the wound looked like. So that's the idea behind controlling those temporary branches is by making that reduction cut we can slow down the growth rate relative to the trunk and get to a point where we can safely make 
um, a removal cut and not have to worry about creating uh, wound or creating permanent wounds and cavities in the tree. So this is what it looked like in 2016. And as I was doing my observation, I noticed, and you saw this picture at the very beginning, I noticed this one branch that was growing up and you can see this is the, the central leader. So it's growing right along the leader. And because I was paying attention, I was able to take care of it very early and very easily. And this kind of a cut you can make any time of year. All right. Any questions before we get into uh, pruning evergreens? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we yeah. hear you. But okay. you explained it so well, I don't have a question. Jim, I do have one question. Um, okay. Different slides showed basically where you have a competing branch um, that don't don't prune it if it's one half the size of the main trunk. Right. Another slide somewhere said one third. So one half. So one third is the um, is that is where we start getting concerned. If it's below, if the aspect ratio is below one third, then we can prune it off, no problem. One third to one half is kind of marginal. You get to one half and now you're really getting into where you're almost certain to wind up with uh, decay or any cavity in the, in the trunk of the tree. So one third is bigger than one, or one half is bigger than one third. So that makes it even more problematic than one third. Does that make sense? Okay. Start worrying at yep. one third. Thanks. At one half, you really worry. So Jim, Bill Gillespie here. Uh-huh. And, and so this overall strategy you just elaborated on was, so these reduction cuts are not, uh, you know, just clipping off the end of a branch, which I've seen some you know, so-called tree experts do, but rather very selectively uh, reducing, uh, you know, some of the branches, maybe just one of the branches on a limb that puts it sort of in a less dominant state near, than your central leader that allows you to take it off at a later time. Yep. Want to make sure exactly I got that. Right. Yeah, and it's then, not, we're not heading, making heading cuts. We are making reduction cuts at a lateral branch, or as we'll see in a little while, could be at a bud. But Bye. we are looking for a, no, a node to make that branch and we are making it in a very particular way. But you're exactly right. We're reducing the dominance of that terminal bud and therefore slowing down the growth of the tree, of the branch relative to the rest of the tree. Great and very well explained. So just to summarize something uh, before the break, uh, we talked a lot about how to do a removal cut. And in the end, I thought the message was the cut should be at the branch collar and it should be parallel with the growth force of the main leader. Did I get that right? right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> Let me just chime in also. One thing uh, Hugh has often, uh, Hugh Robinson's often mentioned, and I just thought was great advice was make sure your equipment is really sharp oh, and yeah. clean. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk a little bit about that either on Saturday or at the end of the lecture, depending on how much time we have. Okay. Thank so. you. You're welcome. Let's move on to pruning evergreens. Now remember evergreens uh, that are not dicots, so conifers, there's no plan B for them. So when we're pruning world conifers, um, <clears throat> we're looking mostly at pines, spruces, and firs. 
Uh, you generally have a single stem and you get a new roll of branches every year. There's usually no training involved with these things. They are what they are. When you are pruning, we don't do any of that fancy reduction cut because there's no plan B. There are no axillary buds to worry about. We're not going to be able to make cuts that are going to stimulate interior growth. Either the branch comes off at the trunk or it doesn't. If you want to be, if you want your plant to be bushier, what you can do is pinch the candle. And essentially that is a heading cut where you are removing the primary or the terminal bud of that branch. It's not going to release other branch, other branches, but it will allow um, the energy in that branch to go into the laterals that were made before, the, just as that uh, candle was produced. This is a trick the, um, the Christmas tree growers use when they get to um, just before they expect that tree to sell or be harvested. They'll pinch those candles and they'll get uh, more growth uh, or more lateral growth um, in those branches. But you're not going to get any more interior growth with uh, these world branch or world conifers. Um, with the random branched evergreens, these things like you and Arborvitae, cedar, <coughs> etc. Again, they usually have a strong central leader. They usually don't have any much any if uh, much training. They don't have a plan B, so you're not going to be able to stimulate interior growth like you might be able to with um, a dicot. Um, but because they have this random branching pattern, there are a lot more primary meristems out there, a lot more uh, branch tips that can take over and grow at least on that outer shell where they're getting some sunlight. A lot of these species you can hedge, uh, use and arborvitaes and cedars and junipers, you can definitely uh, cut into a hedge. And that's essentially what you're doing is you're making heading cuts on them. Usually you wanna prune these in late summer or late spring or summer. If you prune them during the dormant season, you're gonna get a lot of uh, vigorous spring growth. That may or may not be a bad, uh, a bad thing. If you want vigorous spring growth, then by all means, prune during the dormant season. So a lot of this is trying to figure out how the plant's going to respond to the pruning at what particular time of year and respond differently at different times of years of the year. And then finally, um, evergreen di dicots, things like magnolias and laurels, um, some of our hollies, of course, are evergreen. American holly is. Uh, some of the rhododendrons are evergreen and the privets and euonymuses. These things are dicot just because they hold on to their leaves over the winter. You prune them the same way we have just talked about. Uh, they are dicots, and so you prune them like dicots. Okay. Now I wanna talk a little bit about pruning shrubs. And if you are gonna be pruning shrubs or you're pruning flowering trees like uh, dogwoods, you do wanna pay attention to whether that plant flowers on the new wood or the old wood. And what does that mean? Well, remember that uh, the wood is, or the shoots are where the flowers are being produced. Um, it's coming from the primary meristem. And essentially what it comes down to is different plants create their flower buds at different times of the year. So the meristem will differentiate into flower or leaf or shoot at different uh, times of year. So the plants that bloom on old wood those flower meristems are formed in, usually in the fall or the winter. And these are things that usually bloom early in the growing season. So things that bloom in late March or April or May 
usually are blooming on old wood. And so you want to prune after they flower so that they will, the wood that's left uh, will start producing those flower buds for next year. On the other hand, there are some plants that bloom on new wood. And what that means is those flower buds are not made until you start getting shoot expansion. These are usually summer bloomers, things like uh, clethral nefolia or shrubby St. John's wort, things that are in or shrubs or woody plants in bloom right now or may bloom later in the year. These you want to prune before during the dormant season before bud break, because once that shoot starts to develop, it's going to eventually produce a flower bud and produce the flower. So the way to look at it you, is between the early spring bloomers and the late spring, early summer or summer bloomers are the late uh, the early spring bloomers are old wood. Uh, the new um, or the uh, <clears throat> late bloomers are usually new wood. And just to visualize that, this is a pinkster azalea. <coughs> this is what it looked like in January. You can see this is the big flower bud that is then going to produce this whirl of flowers at about the same time the shoots start to elongate. And as you can imagine, if you prune this in the winter, you're gonna cut off this flower bud and you're not gonna get the flowering. So you actually should have, these should have already been pruned because these buds are, or these new shoots are beginning to form those flower buds for next year. On the other hand, here's Clethra alnifolia. You can see in, um, Late April, early May, all we've got is bud break and they're starting to make shoots. They're not gonna flower until July. So the right time to prune these would have been before they started to bud out. But again, same thing applies to trees that uh, you're growing for flowering. And the whole point here, of course, is these are plants that you uh, that are out in the landscape that you put out there specifically for the flowers. <coughs> so you're trying to protect them. However, we are starting to uh, grow or plant for wildlife. And this becomes a little bit trickier because you've got plants like um, flowering dogwood. You can see it's still got its leaves, but there's the flower bud for next spring. On the other hand, these are the, uh, this is the fruit from this year. So if you're gardening for uh, wildlife, you run into a little bit of a conundrum because if you wait until after the fruit is gone, it's too late and you're gonna lose your flower production for next year. On the other hand, if you prune right after the flowers finish, you're not gonna get the fruit production this year. Uh, my best advice on this is again, to be patient. You divide the tree in half or thirds or quarters and you prune one section each year. So you're only giving up some of the flowering or some of the fruiting uh, as you go forward. But this is something they don't normally talk about because nobody had been thinking about grow or planting for wildlife and those berries, which are really important to our neotropical migrants, particularly things like dogwood, because they may have much higher fat content than the non-native berries. Okay. So that's one aspect of pruning, not just shrubs, but also uh, generally small trees that we're planting for flowers. Let's talk a little bit about plant or pruning shrubs. And I want to talk about this because there are some of these techniques and methods that we can use on trees, or at least we'll illustrate some of the things we need to be concerned about. <coughs> we are still going to be making reduction and removal cuts at nodes. And again, 
the branch unions are still nodes, but the buds now, uh, particularly in, in pruning shrubs become nodes. And for certain types of shrubs, the ground is a node. So with the shrubs, we're going to make reductions at buds as well as laterals. We're also possibly making removals at ground level or some, in some cases, especially with roses, where you have um, root suckers, you need to dig all the way down and make the removal at the union of the of the uh, the root or the sucker and the root, because if you just cut it at ground level, it will continue to grow. And what do I mean by reducing to a bud? So the bud is creating a node, and we want to make a slanted reduction cut, just like we would if it was uh, if this was a lateral branch. Um, we don't want to make it too deep because if we do, then the bud can dry out. And we don't want to leave a stub above it because this will rot. And I have actually seen this happen with nursery stock where they are making uh, essentially hedging cuts on plants that should not be hedged. And then you've got all this, these little dead stubs above the lower node where they should have been pruned. And what's the, the difference between reducing to a bud and reducing to a lateral? And so when we reduce to a lateral, again, <coughs> this terminal bud's going to take over and help suppress these, um, these buds along here so you don't have as much uh, grow or um, vigorous growth below the cut. When we reduce to a bud, now the bud's going to sprout, but we're also going to get sprouting along here because that bud is not going to be as effective because it's not a terminal bud, it's an axillary bud. So it's not going to be as effective at suppressing these. You'll get some suppression out of this lateral, but you will get a bit more growth. So when we reduce to a bud like this, we are doing it because we want shoots. So there are different types of shrubs. This is what I call a dendric. These are dendric shrubs. These grow more like trees where they tend to have a single central leader or a single um, uh, emergence from the ground. And this is um, a very tree-like shrub. This is a red buckeye. And so no mystery here. You prune this just like you would a tree like we've been talking about with the tree. This is more of a mounding shrub. This is uh, a non-native azalea. And here, what we're going to be doing, boxwood would be another type. You're going to be pruning mainly in the interior space here to control the height of it. And what you would want to do is, in some cases, make reduction removal cuts. But in other cases, you want to reduce to an inward uh, pointing bud because when you cut this out, you're going to create a bald spot here. So reducing to those interior buds or interior facing buds is going to promote growth. It's going to, from these lateral branches, it's gonna fill in that bald spot. And again, this is my um, rhododendron. So when I looked at it, I noticed a couple of things in my observations. I got a colic up here. It's not as obvious, but I've got some road growth that's going out this way and another colic over here. And my wife was complaining about clearance getting around this shrub. So I figured I was gonna have to prune in this area. Well, it turns out after further discussion, what she was concerned about was not the lateral growth and getting around it. She was concerned about these branches here that we're starting to crowd out. Um, we've got a bunch of other plants in here, some, some native azaleas and other things. And I was still concerned about this extra growth here and here. So this was removal cuts because I wasn't gonna create a bald spot here. This was mostly removal cuts, although I did some reductions to interior buds. And this was also removal because I didn't want 
new growth here. <clears throat> so again, this goes back to that idea of recognizing that plan B exists and planning for it. But as far as the cuts I made, here's uh, a fairly typical one. You know, the, the, um, the parent went this way. So this was a uh, reduction to a lateral that's going to produce less additional growth than if I had reduced to a bud. The other types of shrubs are what I call cane shrubs. So this is what I, uh, a fountain cane shrub. So we have multiple canes coming out of basically the same root plate here at the surface. This is a suckering shrub. This, by the way, is a morpho fruticosa. This is uh, Viburnum dentatum. And you can see this has a bunch of uh, very uh, do apically dominant uh, branches that are coming up off of the root system here. Um, and so you prune these shrubs a little bit differently because we don't have much in the way this one, these do these fountain types do have a bit more um, lateral uh, laterals on them. This one, um, as you can see, this is fairly typical. And these are really small laterals to do reductions to. So you can reduce to the bud, but mostly with these types of shrubs, these suckering shrubs, we're going to um, do removal cuts at the ground, at or just above ground level. So we're going to cut this all the way back to the base. And as you can see here, the, I let this get way too crowded. So we would, so what you would do in this, what I did in this case was I went in uh, with my loppers and my handsaw and I started cutting these out. And what you want to do when you're doing that is take out the biggest ones because those are the oldest canes and the ones that are more, that are closer to death than the smaller ones. And you can see significant difference in the number and the space that's available within the, this plant. For those uh, fountaining types, typically you're going to prune those also like you would trees where you're doing reductions to uh, lateral bud or uh, lateral branches, or um, you can all, you'd also be doing this type of uh, removal at the base. Now there is, and this is what's, uh, this gets back to what we talked about with plan B, what we call uh, extensive rejuvenation. So we're cutting back to six to 10 inches uh, or for larger shrubs, it may be uh, from 10 to 16 inches, but we're going to make a severe, we're cutting back severely to um, stimulate new growth. And what we're looking for here is um, we are, it, what we're looking for here is to do reductions to buds. And so this works for especially things like forsythia and shrub dogwoods, beautyberry. It also, as I have found out in the course of this year, works for Amorpha fruticosa. So here is my uh, false indigo bush and we're for fruticosa. We did, we're doing an extensive rejuvenation. I cut it, this is, you can see, I severely cut it back. And all of those cuts I made either to a bud, and you can see my reduction to a bud, or in some cases, because of the way this tree, this plant grows, there is clearly a node here and there's a whole bunch of buds in here. So I reduce to that node. Again, notice these cuts are not flat across the, the uh, axis of growth, they are angled. And what happened was, I didn't know whether this was gonna work. And for a long time this spring, I thought it had died. And then all of a sudden I started to see a few sprouts. And again, this is what it looks like now. You can see all of this growth in here. And what I will do 
the next part of the plant is sometime during the dormant season after all the leaves have fallen off and after all the herbaceous growth has died back i will go in and i will start managing this by doing removal cuts on some of this these sprouts because this is way too much growth to do for this plant to support uh, this is not what they normally look like but the reason I wanted to share this with you is you can do the same thing on trees. In fact, uh, before earlier, before anybody else joined, Nora and I were talking about a situation where park staff are just going through and they're making heading cuts on anything that is approaching the path or the sidewalk. And what do you do about those? Well, potentially what that is going to do is lead to growth that looks like this. And so after a year or two, you can go in and you can manage these for the sprouts that are doing what you want that plant to do. Um, the other option, of course, is to go in and make a proper removal cut at the trunk or go in and make a reduction cut further in to a lateral that will then become the terminal branch of it. Um, <clears throat> and I just left this in because I forgot to take it out. We can also do gradual, gradual rejuvenation, but this does get to that idea of observing the plant, setting your objectives, making a plan, and then making cuts, but don't be in too big a hurry. So what you're doing here is you're essentially doing that extensive rejuvenation, only instead of pruning the whole thing at once, you only prune a third. And the first year you take out the one third of the stem, the oldest stems. The second year you take out half of the remaining and the third year you finish it off. But here you have a three year pruning plan on this <clears throat> plant. You're doing a lot more than 25% uh, canopy reduction, but it's because that was the plan and that's what you were trying to achieve. You were managing and pruning specifically to get those shoots that you could, uh, that you wanted to, ma to uh, manage. <clears throat> because that's part of this rejuvenation is coming back after a growing season or two and managing those shoots that you have produced. And we can do the same thing with trees. And before we go on to something different, any questions? Dean. Uh, what time of year do you do this extensive rejuvenation? Would that have to be when it's dormant? Um, yeah, you usually want to do it when it's dormant. That way you can see what you're doing as part of it. Um, it makes it easier to find the buds if it's uh, dormant. And actually, um, I think I did that pruning in, let's see, I taught the Master Naturalist class at the beginning of March. So I did that in early February. But yeah. that's when you'd want to do it is during the, um, the dormant season. You have another question or not? Just didn't put your hand down, Dean. Any other questions? You guys are either full or I'm a much better teacher than I thought. So Jim, I do have a question about all these shrubs. In uh -huh. nature, I mean, out in the forest and stuff, what happens to the... Um, the cane-like structure, is it just part of the life cycle that eventually yep. it gets too big and all dies and another one yep. comes on? That's part of it. But okay. it also depends on, um, on where you are and uh, what's out there with the plant. So for example, the shrub dogwoods uh, not only take to this kind of uh, pruning very well and one of the good things about them is they are suckering so when you make those uh, pruning cuts uh, and they are a suckering cane type they they grow like the dentatums 
Uh, when you make those cuts, you can put them in, dip them in a little root tone and stick them in the ground and you get new shrub. So it's a great way of multiplying that plant, not that it needs much help if it's in good seat, a good spot. Uh, but when I pruned that dentatum, uh, we put all of the, um, the cuttings or most of them went into a bucket of water to keep the, the tissue moist. Um, and then we took them out to the bee lab and about half of them are growing out there now <clears throat> as shrubs uh, producing viburnum flowers for the bees out there. Um, but there is some controversy about whether or not red twig dogwood is native to Northern Virginia. The place where I know it is native and you see a lot of it are in what they call the parks out at Yellowstone. So those big open grassy areas that have this woody growth in the middle of it, a lot of that is red twig dogwood. And they're getting pruned regularly because that's what the elk eat in the winter. So in some cases, this type of pruning we're doing is actually mimicking um, browse that these would normal naturally um, get. Okay. All right. Now, uh, for Jim, I'm, yes. I'm sorry. This is Kate. Is mm -hmm. there any particular reason? I mean, I'm thinking right now specifically of an enormous nine bark that I have growing. Um, that you would do the gradual versus the non-gradual you know, extensive rejuvenation? I or is it just for aesthetics? No. Um, no. Uh, for me, anyway, because I don't know all the shrubs that you can do this that will respond well to that extensive rejuvenation. In the case of my false indigo bush, my amorpha fruticoso, I didn't know that it worked, but we had looked at it. We decided it was getting kind of ratty. It was getting kind of big. Um, and, you know, we weren't going to be too broken up of, about it if it died. We would find okay. something else to put in that spot. So if you really, and I'm not sure nine bark will take to this as well. Okay. So that would be a reason to do the gradual rejuvenation is so there is part of the plant that you have not really whacked right that could take over in case that uh happens uh okay. the other thing is yeah there are aesthetic reasons uh you do this you do this kind of pruning to beauty berries but not all of the stems that you prune like that are going to respond and they may die so doing the gradual where you only do one third every year would be a way of ensuring the plant stays full and you've got stuff to work with. Hey, yeah. Jim, just that's that's um, this is Melissa. That that's I a hundred percent agree with Jim. And and in times, for example, um, Dumbarton Oaks removed all their they they wanted to rejuvenate prune their forsythia, and, and before I've rejuvenated pruned. A large, a very large area of um, now I can't. Jasminum nudiflorum is a, a jasmine shrub. Um, it takes quite a long time for the plant to recover. So, so this is so much less um, recovery. Yeah, okay. it, this this is Bob. I I I did extensive rejuvenation pruning on some. I have three hollies across the back, all about three feet tall and about mm -hmm. same wide. And I decided to experiment three to four years ago and I cut one six inches above the ground and, and, and chose which trunks I wanted. And then sort of did a gradual on the other one over the next several years and then just prune the other like a normal shrub. And, and while, I mean, I agree with Melissa, it, take, it takes time for the shrub to recover. The one that I did the extensive cut on actually is much, much better plant at this point than the other two. And I, st I still need to prune the other two. So <laughs> if there's something to be yeah, said, I'm to just throwing in the towel and just going after it. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, the different shrubs respond differently. Um, I heard somebody say that this is actually good for what they call the Victorian shrubs, which would be things like spirea and for scythia that were really popular, um, what, 100 and, well, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, but I don't know that much about shrubs. The main reason I want to talk about this is because I've mentioned the plan B, and this is an example of how we manipulate plan B to get growth that we want. So in this case, I wanted more vigorous growth. I wanted some new growth on that shrub. And now I've got all these, uh, these sprouts to work with. And uh, as I said, in Europe, for some of these really old trees that are um, retrenching, they're pruning them this way you know, pruning to those lateral buds and things specifically to generate those sprouts so that they can man manipulate and manage those sprouts. And so this is, you know, this is uh, a product, you know, we've been doing this with shrubs for a long time, but we can do it with trees because basically trees and shrubs biologically are the same thing. You know, they have primary and secondary meristems, at least the die cuts. And, you know, it's just shrubs don't get as big. They tend to be branchier. Uh, the other thing about shrubs is we don't have to worry as much about uh, the risk associated with adventitious growth as you do when you top a tree uh, and you're 60 feet up off the ground. And now you've got two or three inch diameter branches that are poorly attached and may come off in a windstorm, you know. You don't worry about that because gravity uh, when you're talking about a shrub anyway, because they don't fall as far. All right. But this is something, and, and the other part of the lesson is you have to be aware that this can happen if you don't do things right. And then you get all these uh, sprouts that you didn't want. So Part of it is if we make those reduction cuts properly, we don't get the sprouting. If we make them improperly or we make them in a way that we want, when we want sprouts, we can get them. All right, uh, I only have a couple sections left. So first we're gonna talk about root pruning. This does not apply to monocots. Uh, monocots have, uh, do not have dendritic root systems. They don't sprout. They don't make, uh, when you cut a root, a monocot root, it doesn't spread out and make new roots. But when you cut dicots and conifers, they do. And unlike pruning the crown, we are no longer concerned about making heading cuts. Because, yeah, we may get adventitious uh, root growth, but the roots are being supported by the ground, unlike the canopy, which is being supported by it itself. So we no longer worry about branches. We no longer worry about nodes. We don't really make reduction cuts. Um, we make heading cuts. And I'll show you what a heading cut is uh, in a second. But essentially, a heading cut is a cut that goes perpendicular to the length of growth <coughs> or the axis of growth, and it's between a node. So this is how you would make a heading cut. Here you've got a node. There you've got a node. But now you're making this, this cut right across it. And if you look at that, you're going to notice that that's essentially what we do when we top trees. This is why we have not talked about making heading cuts until now, because when we're, we, when we're working with the branches, we're worried about sprouting. When we're working with the root system, we're not worried about sprouting. In fact, we want sprouting. So there are two ways we're going to, you may apply root pruning that are associated with uh, tree planting. The first is, when you have a, a plant or a tree that you want to transplant. 
ideally you're going to go out the spring before you're going to transplant and you are going to use a very sharp shovel and go all the way around the tree but you are not going to make a continuous cut around the tree so you make drive your shovel into the ground you pull it out you skip a shovel a blade's length you make another cut and so on until you go all the way around the tree tree because what you're doing then is any roots that you cut when you make those those or when you push the shovel into the ground those are heading cuts and that is going to encourage the plant to make more roots inside this dash circle and maybe some that are going to grow outside in the fall you come in and you do the same thing, only now you're put, driving your shovel in between where you put it in before. So you're finishing those cuts. And then over the, the winter, the roots that you cut during that in that second time are going to also be making absorbing roots and branching out in here and possibly sending some roots out beyond the cut. And then the next spring you come in and this outer circle should be about six inches beyond the inner circle. <clears throat> and so what this does, because the trees tend to start growing structural roots around the base that hold the tree up and put more of their root growth or their fine absorbing roots and things further away from the trunk, this is forcing the, the tree to grow more roots in the area that's going to become the root ball. Um, Jim, yeah. How far? How far out is the first circle? The first circle would be probably. It's going to depend a lot on the size of the plant, but yeah. if this is like a two-inch diameter plant, you know how big or uh, okay. tree. So it would be maybe twelve to eighteen inches out from the trunk of a two-inch diameter, where you're going to wind right. up. Right, is a very. As a very practical matter, how do you know where you put the spade in in the, in the spring that uh, fall? You know, that's one of the things I've never really figured out. I've never actually done this. I've just seen it done. But the idea is, and I suppose you could mark it with flags where you, uh, where you did it. Um, some of your better wholesale nurseries do this before they dig the trees. Uh, and if you can find trees that have been root pruned prior to digging, those are the ones you want to buy because they're going to have a lot more absorbing roots in that root ball. Okay. Another way we use root pruning is in construction. Um, you always want to use sharp tools and make clean cuts. You should expose the roots before cutting and pay attention to the rule of thumb with roots, which is roots smaller than your thumb are going to seal up and they're going to sprout vigorously very quickly after you cut them. So those smaller roots are what are going to regrow your root system. The bigger roots, which are closer to the stem part of that critical root zone, are going to, um, you're going to lose a lot more of your root system and they're not going to respond. And again, you're likely to wind up with decay moving into those root systems. So some of you may have been there for Root Appreciation Day down in Prince William County. This was a tree that we had, that somebody had decided was going to get cut down. So we went in and we excavated it. This is the ideal way to do this with construction is using an air spade because it can expose the roots. You're going to lose some of that fine root mass, but the tree constantly grows and sheds that. But you can expose those roots and make good clean cuts where they are. Um, so you might expose the root here and say, hey, we're going to move it back and we're going to make our cut here and you pull your silt fencing, your limited clearing and grading back a little bit to protect this bigger root. Um, but that would be the ideal way. 
certainly the uh, way that it frequently happens where they just use backhoe to and they break the roots wherever they happen to is not a good way to root prune for construction. As, as tree stewards, the way you are going to root prune most likely is going to be this way. So this is a containerized plant. I pulled it out of the, the pot. I was thinking about trying to bare root it, but it just was so pot bound, that was not an option. But I still had these roots, these fairly large roots that were growing in the wrong direction. Uh, those weren't the only ones. You can see there's another circling root there. These things do not correct once you put them in the ground. And, you know, a lot of people will take that ball and butterfly it. That is, they grip, grip, grip the bottom and they rip it apart. Or they will take one of those uh, planting knives or whatever, and they will make vertical slits around the perimeter of the ball. The research shows none of that does any good. What does do good is what we call squaring the ball. So with this, I took my uh, bandsaw. Um, I was due to get a new blade for it anyway, so I didn't worry about this. This can dull your blade, uh, or this is not a bandsaw, it's a bow saw. Uh, I like using a bow saw in this application because it's really easy to change the blades and they're cheap. But what you do is you just slice down the outside of the root ball <clears throat> from top to bottom. You may turn it over and discover you've got a lot of this same stuff going on in the bottom and then you cut the bottom off of it. And so you can see, here's my thumb. Uh, here's my thumb. This is a much smaller root ball, but I have removed all of this questionable growth around the edges and plant it that way. And as I said, this is called squaring the ball. Um, this is the thing I like to teach to people in face-to-face -face sessions because I love to watch the look of horror on their face when I start describing this. But it does do a good job of getting that plant to then grow. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is when you have a root ball like this, you've got a lot of absorbing roots here. And this thing is going to dry out really quickly. We had to water it uh, every other day, at least last summer. This uh, spring, even after we had the rain last year, or last week, within about two or three days, it was starting to wilt. And so we're still having to water this thing because it's got so much root mass right here below the tree or below the plant. All right, last section is uh, pruning mature trees. Um, a couple of caveats before we start on this. Climbing trees is dangerous. Using a chainsaw is dangerous. Using a chainsaw while climbing a tree is dangerous, type, times dangerous. So I'm pretty sure <coughs> Melissa, who was talking about, um, <coughs> excuse me, who was talking about risk, does not want you guys doing this. That's right. Neither do I. Uh, oh, is Vincent there? <laughs> we, we, I recognize that voice. I just want to make it double clear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, if you look at the riskiest professions. Yep. Uh, Tree climbers is six times the all industry average for uh, death and police and fire is only four times. Right. All right. So I'm trying to bring this in under five. Nevertheless, as tree stewards, you may be evaluating those trees. So you want to look at those scaffold branches. Are they well spaced vertically or radially? Do you have good branch unions? Can you see the, that U shape? and that visible bark ridge. Uh, elm, again, elm and lindens are one exception where they seem to do fine with a V-shaped um, branch union. You want to look for any dead, broken, diseased, over long branches, as well as any rubbing branches. Those are all things that you might make note of. 
and report to Vincent so he can report it to his contractor to get him out there eventually to uh, deal with it. We had that discussion about shear plane cracks. Well, this is one that I saw in Fairfax City as I was walking around. You can see the crack here, but you can also see the wound wood and that this crack is fixing itself. You could speed that up by potentially bolting uh, the pieces together. It's almost like a surgeon uh, putting stitches in after he makes an incision. It just, things get, uh, get uh, cleaned up faster that way. But that branch is in perfectly good shape. Uh, I just happened to notice those bulges. Um, included bark. Unfortunately, my little crab apple does have some included bark, but again, these are not really big pieces, so I'm not too worried about them. This is from my neighbor's uh, silver maple, much bigger tree. Uh, this was well up into the tree, so this is something that I would be concerned about. This gets to that whole risk thing, because what's happening here is you can see there was the locus of growth here. There was a locus of growth here, and obviously this tree had more problems just the included bark. But these two pieces are growing and as they grow, they're pushing against each other. And at not at where this uh, cut was made because it had already got to the point where now the cambium went all the way around both pieces. But further up the tree, you would have that pressure. If storm hits it just right, this is what happens to it. That's why calorie pairs, or particularly Bradford pairs, have a tendency for this, what I call hand of God pruning, because I've seen these where every scaffold branch fails and they're all lying on the ground. What you're left with is four foot high stump, but it's because they all have bad branching. And you can even see the included bark here uh, relative to the, the uh, tree. Here's another example from my colleague, Joe Rossetti. This was his red bud. Unfortunately, he did not do something about this before the January snowstorm, and it actually split off. But notice where he made the cut here. And that's how you deal with this. If you wanted to remove this branch, and this is small enough because he's obviously standing on the, the ground here that you could do it, you wouldn't necessarily go this low, but you would go down right below this and make a, uh, a, or a horizontal cut perpendicular to this axis of growth into this and cut this piece off. And it may seem like that leaves a big wound, but keep in mind, this is already bark. So that's already wounded. So the, or that's already closed. So your wound would be just this area here that would then have to close up. And again, as I said, with these mature trees, sometimes pruning is not the answer. Another potential solution would have been for him to put bolts through here to relieve the strain from that um, poor branch union. <clears throat> with um, mature trees, even if they are uh, smaller trees, this again is my crab apple. This is a situation that I'm look, that I'm keeping an eye on. I notice these two branches are getting close together. I can still get my finger through there, so I'm not worried about much rubbing. But down the line, this is going to become a problem, and I don't really have an opportunity for any reduction below this point on either of these. So eventually, I'm going to have to remove one. And I chose this one, and I did the reduction cut. So I use that same principle of you do the reduction, you slow the growth down, and you make the removal wound as small as possible. And I've mentioned uh, health. Originally, this was going to be the lateral. And my wife, who is my photographer, was taking these pictures, pointed out there's a big canker here on this lateral. So that doesn't make, so that makes it not a great candidate for being the new terminal uh, branch or where I'd reduce to. So I went down to a little bit lower on the tree and did the reduction there. 
All right. Some of your standard pruning practices are crown cleaning. That's removing just dead, diseased, and broken branches. Uh, this is something you can do pretty much any time of year. Uh, crown raising. This is getting into the issue of clearance, where you're removing those lower branches for clearance. Again, you can use that. It's a temporary branch. We're going to reduce it, slow it down. The other thing about doing reduction, particularly on lower branches, that may be enough to cause the branch to die. And if that happens, then you've got dead wood to remove and you can do that uh, much more freely than you can live tissue. And then crown thinning is where we're going to be removing branches from all over the crown, both interior and exterior. We don't want a lion tail. And if you're wondering what lion tailing is, this is a great picture from the uh, Texas ISA chapter of what it looks like. So, and it's called lion tailing because of that little poof of hair at the end of the lion's tail. And I've actually seen this in Springfield where they not only lion tailed them, but they also topped them. So this is, you know, this is like a hedge 30 or 40 feet above the ground. And this does a whole lot of things. First of all, they went way over that 25% re re uh, removal um, recommendation. They also, as you can imagine, by leaving all the crown way up here, they have really screwed up their lever arms. So they're putting a lot more pressure on the root plate. And then of course, there's this suicidal access via a ladder. So I imagine that the guy who did all this cutting was not roped into the tree. Um, and that is even more dangerous than uh, <coughs> the industry average, which includes people who do it safely. I don't know if we count people like these in our statistics. Um, and I think this is the last thing I wanted to talk about because I do get this question. Uh, this is my pawpaw in 2013, the top broke out of it. So what did, I do? what did I do? There was more of the central leader here. And this goes back to Nora, your question about doing the removal on the central leader. Well, here's an example of when you would do that. So I did a removal cut to this lateral because this was the um, highest intact lateral below the break. That's what it looked like when I made the cut in 2013. This is what it looks like now. And you can see, this is pro this amazes people, but you can see how this branch, the angle here is getting less. And so the tree, because of the internal pressures on the cambium is actually starting to push that branch up into a more vertical uh, growth pattern. And so that's all I had. And I will now answer whatever questions you might have. Hugh. This is just a, an observation. Um, I very much appreciate, Jim, you putting this effort into acquainting us with structural pruning. And I want to reiterate that the tree stewards Ever since I became a tree steward and in consultation with members of the uh, park staff have been doing what we re have referred to as functional pruning, which to me is another name for pruning mature trees or standard pruning practices. And I'm a little bit concerned about where we're going with the pruning program and what we tree stewards will be encouraged to do. I would welcome having us assume structural pruning when new trees are planted and during their early growth. But I see no reason why we should discontinue pruning mature trees, which we do with our feet on the ground. We do not use chainsaws. We are safe. I would, if Vincent is there, I hope he will chime in and say, what is it you are going to be asking tree stewards to do 
ongoing. I mean, we were asked to suspend our functional pruning until this course was uh, created. And I would certainly agree that uh, there was reason for us to have this course. What we have been doing for tree stewards and our tree steward uh, classes, we basically did a very basic introduction to pruning. And the only way we got tree stewards well qualified was by bringing candidates out and having them work with experienced pruners. And I think we have done a very decent job over the years, but I go back to a, to a park or a schoolyard and I see where we may have been remiss. We had sent somebody out who was a supposed experienced pruner who left stubs and may have missed some other things that could have been done. And I really am looking forward to the hands-on part of this program, whereby we are going to be working with uh, pe uh, qualified people, arborists from the park staff to make sure we are doing the job right. But I certainly hope, and I think uh, people like Don Walsh and Joan Dombrowski and Jan Hull and John Stewart and uh, Dean ML would want to continue the functional pruning that we've done and simply add the structural pruning of younger trees to our itinerary. Am I correct, Vincent? Are we going to be able to continue with both emphases? Thanks, you. And I really do want to reiterate that I appreciate all the work that you and, and everybody on the tree stewards have done um, for the, the past years. Fun functional pruning is kind of a term I um, we, we kind of collaboratively came up with in, in the intermediate. And this is kind of like a next level uh, kind of project. I would say that functional pruning is in, included in this. This structural, you use the knowledge from the structural pruning training to, uh, to even provide an even better service to our trees. And you can use this knowledge from structural pruning on more mature trees as well within the limitations of what you can do. That's, the, um, that's what I wanted to hear. That's great because we have a very, we have some very, very, I think, well-qualified people who are very enthusiastic yep. and look forward to being invited out and having places that are trees identified to us where we can go in and do a, a credible job. Yeah, we should be, we should be looking at every tree that you can reasonably managed so nothing beyond like what you already know no chainsaws no all that no 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 limbs you can't reach um and including park trees and street trees as we go forward um i i even learned things from this presentation and i, I want to thank uh jim for this presentation uh because it's it's very helpful so i'm looking forward to continuing all the work we've been doing with better knowledge and uh sharing that knowledge with uh, new pruners as they come on Right. Wonderful. That's the message I was hoping I'd hear. And so what um, what what the program is, is that um, the 11 um, people that are trained will finish and then the next group and then as as we get this um, moving, then there'll be another group. And as they come in, that's when they would begin pruning. Is that what you're asking also? Yeah, that's that's what was my understanding, but I was concerned why we had suspended our functional pruning until we had this class. And uh, Vincent's answer to me was what I had hoped the uh, program would consist of adding <laughs> the knowledge we gained through today's program and the hands-on programs to what we've already been doing and confirming that what we have been doing was being done correctly. Um, not um, having seen what you, you not having seen what you've done, I won't say that you've done it correctly, but I would point <laughs> out the pruning system is the natural pruning system. Structural pruning is an application of the natural pruning system to young trees because we're pruning them for structure. What you are calling functional pruning 
is also an application of the natural pruning system to trees at a different stage of life for potentially different purposes. But it's still the same pruning system, whether it's on young trees or mature trees. Okay, the terminology issue probably has uh, something to yeah. do with my concern. Okay, right. And and so there's you know in the beginning they're talking about. Um, uh, did you talk about? And I I wasn't able to listen to everything about tree canopy percentage, and so yeah, we talked about that. And so one of the one of the key pieces of structural pruning at, at any age, or, or you could call it also um, functional pruning, is to not, it is that clearance pruning isn't done, um, uh, let's see, independently of considering the canopy structure. And so you make different dis decisions based on the canopy percentages. I'm sure as we do the hands-on training over the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be able to identify those concerns and make sure we're all on the same page. I want to say one last thing. It was uh, I really want to bring credit to Melissa on this, to her uh, her attention to detail and, atten and, and looking forward to creating a, an even better program that we have. It's really um, kind of kicked me into second gear to try to restart this as well. So I, I would uh, lean on her knowledge and, and, and the presentation to go forward. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I do have one question of Melissa. Okay. Where am I supposed to be at nine o'clock on Saturday morning? <laughs> Let's let's all meet at. Um, uh, now I can't remember the name of that part. All right, just send us an email. Um, down the street here. Oh, I can. It's Vincent. What's the one? Uh, Barcroft. Right Barcroft. Let's all meet at Barcroft in the. Um, Barcroft. It'd, be, it'd be good to send an exact location. There's a lot of spaces, yeah. so send okay. a map with a point. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I I got that last week let's meet at eleanor c lawrence park it's only 1700 acres <laughs> <laughs> let's try to avoid that <laughs> 1700 acres wow yeah that, that's half of our length well let me just say on behalf of the tree stewards that we really appreciate jim once again stuffing our heads with knowledge which we will try to remember and also Vincent and Melissa for giving us this opportunity. So thank you very much. And can I stop the recording now? You can, unless there are other questions. <laughs>